This morning, we have the, the opportunity, uh, Pastor Nate is, is actually out of town traveling, and we have a, a friend of Oasis, Pastor Mike Marissa, he's going to come share. And if you were at our uh, Biblically Informed uh, Politics, he was, he was part of the panel discussion that night. And one thing I, I've realized just in hearing from, from, from Mike the few occasions and crossing paths with him, he, he cares deeply about God's worth, about God's word and the truth in God's word and how we can apply it to our own lives. So we're uh, super excited for Mike to come share this morning, uh, continuing in our suit up uh, series wrapping it up. So why don't you give Mike a hand as he comes to present the word of God this morning. I appreciate you. Thank you. Thank you. What, a, what an honor it is to be here. I love Oasis Church. And I, uh, you know, you guys are really fortunate. Uh, I get an opportunity in my work to meet with lots of pastors and go into lots of churches and the leadership that Nate and Anna provide here and the entire team is just amazing and uh, what a blessing it is for you to be able to come. And so let's just uh, acknowledge them and celebrate them if you could. <laughs> this was quick. Nate called me Thursday night and said, hey, by the way, <laughs> are you doing anything Sunday? So this message series that he's been going through, you know, thanks, Jay. You're the, you're the best. You guys know Jay's my son, right? <laughs> um, is, a, is a great one because in this time in our culture, as in all times, I mean, we have to always suit up with the full armor of God. So everything that he's been talking about so far has been the defensive parts of the armor, you know. So today we get to talk to about the sword of the Spirit, which is... The Word of God. It's a powerful tool for us. And the beauty of it is, is that it's not only a defensive weapon, but it's also an offensive weapon. And I think in today's culture, one of the things that we've seen so much of is that Christians by and far have decided that we're just going to step back and be quiet and we're not taking an offensive position when we know what the truth is. So let's just review a little bit about how what the Word of God actually is. It is the only source of truth. I know many of you, like me, are frustrated listening to people always talk about, well, that's your truth, this is my truth, I have my truth. You have. No, there's only one truth, and it's the Word of God. And that is the Word that we stand on. It is also an incredible defense against temptation, and we'll see later on Jesus displayed that for us in such a beautiful way after he had been, when he was being tempted in the desert. But whenever we face temptations, the enemy knows where our weak spots are. He knows how to come after us in ways whether it is to commit some kind of a, 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 an egregious sin or it is just to be distracted and to forget that our, our intimacy and time with God is what he values the most. So it's a great use of ability. We have the word of God to defend against temptation whenever we start to feel that happening. It's also an offensive power. Jesus has shown all through the Bible that he can use the word in order to point out truth to people who are clearly in the wrong, on the wrong path. It's a source of strength and encouragement. When you are facing challenges and things are not going the way we thought they should, or this is the only, the, we either have the ability to, the opportunity to focus on the problem that we're experiencing and focus on that challenge, that mountain, or recognize that we find strength and encouragement through the word of God. And then it's the absolute best guidance for daily living. I, I try to encourage people to start their day every day and give God the first hour. Spend some time in prayer, not only talking with Him, uh, but also listening for His response because He will respond. And then just reading the Word to just help us to just understand more and more about who He is and what He expects from us. It's interesting, I, tell, I was telling a group of youth the other day, and they, they said this kind of was in, uh, profound for them, but I said, just picture as much as God loves being with us, just picture that he sits on the end of your bed all night while you're sleeping, and he's just thinking, oh my gosh, I cannot wait for him to wake up so that we can spend some time together. How many of us get up and just jump out of bed and go start our day and leave him there going, oh, but I thought we were going to hang out. We have to really be intentional about spending time together with him. Let's go to the word and just pray together. Father God, it is so good to be in your house this morning and just settle our hearts before you, Lord. We ask that you would speak through us in this word today. I thank you for those who are here and who will watch online, and I commit the service to you now for your glory. Speak to us, Lord. 
Help us to be more like Jesus. And I pray in advance for those who don't yet know Jesus to today come to trust in him and come to know him in a personal way. We thank you, Lord, that you expressed your love for us on the cross, that you first loved us. We give you praise, glory, and honor in Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen. 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 So today, I want to invite you to uh, reflect a little bit on the profound power of God's Word. Ephesians 6.17 describes it as the sword of the Spirit. And it, this is a, a really powerful metaphor because it shows um, the vital role that Scripture plays in our spiritual battles. Jesus himself modeled how we can, word, how we can wield the Word effectively during his own temptation as he was coming out of the desert. Through his responses, we learn how to draw on God's truth to overcome the challenges that we face. So we're all going to face temptations. So let's first consider the context of Jesus' temptation. He had been fasting for 40 days. He was at his most vulnerable time, both physically exhausted, hungry, and alone. This raw human moment in Jesus' life reminds us that though fully divine, he experienced the real pressures of human weakness. He wasn't shielded from suffering or hardship just because he was the Son of God. He endured these same trials we face so that we would recognize that he understands our struggles. In this moment of intense weakness, when most of us might have given in to some fear or despair, Jesus turned to the only thing that could sustain him, the Word of God. Every time Satan tempted him, offering a shortcut to power or some provision or protection that he needed, Jesus responded by quoting Scripture. This is a really powerful lesson for us today because very often when we are at our lowest, whether we're just physically drained, emotionally overwhelmed, or maybe even spiritually dry, we too can find strength in God's Word. That's the restoration power. When we're feeling down and we need to be lifted up, there is nothing that will do it more effectively than the Word of God. His truth guides us and reminds us that we're never alone and that His promises are certain. So, the first temptation that Satan presented to Jesus was to turn breads into stone. Stone into bread. (laughs) After 40 days without food, the temptation to satisfy his hunger probably was very intense. But Jesus doesn't give in to his physical craving. Instead, he responds immediately by quoting Deuteronomy 8.3 and saying, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Now this response isn't just simply a a rejection of Satan's suggestion. It's a declaration of deeper truth. Jesus shows shows us that while our physical needs are real, they're not the most important. What sustains us, truly sustains us, is God's Word. In our own lives, we face temptations to meet immediate desires and needs that we have. Maybe it's the lure of material things or or comfort or some kind of instant gratification that we're hoping the world will give us. But in those moments, it's important for us to remember that what we really need is not fleeting or temporary. It's the eternal sustenance that comes from God's truth. Jesus teaches us that true satisfaction comes from living in alignment with God's Word in a world that is constantly telling us that we have the ability to to satisfy every desire that we have immediately. We're called to trust in God's provision and His timing, even when sometimes it doesn't make sense to us. We have to learn to seek Him first, knowing that His guidance and His peace and His purpose are what we truly need even when our circumstances are urging us to chase after something else. I can't tell you how many times I have felt a prompting from God telling me to go do something, and I start down that path, and then within a few moments, I feel like I am saying to God, okay, I got this. (laughs) I got this. And then you just keep right on going, and then when things go bad, and you turn back around and say, God, you started me here, and he's like, well, you left me a long time ago. You said you had this. So he's going to let us do that. That's not what we want to do. We want to find our peace and our guidance and our confidence and our trust in the Lord and in his word. The second temptation is really interesting because this is something we see happening in our culture today. Satan twists scripture. 
He urges Jesus to throw himself from the temple's highest point, claiming that angels will come to his rescue. What he does here is he quotes Psalm 91, but he does it out of context as a tool to manipulate Jesus into testing God. We hear people that are living outside of the word of God and the plans and the commands of God every day that will pull a scripture out of context and they'll use that to try to fight back against what we're trying to tell them. Jesus responds with unwavering clarity. You shall not put the Lord your God to the test. This is a profound reminder for us as well. We never want to use scripture to justify our own desires or manipulate circumstances for selfish gain. God's word is not a tool for us to bend to our will. Instead, it's a guide to help shape us so that our only focus is to follow his will. Jesus teaches us that true obedience means trusting God's plan without demanding that he act according to ours. The problem we, that I hear from a lot of Christians today, and you'll hear it when they pray too sometimes, is I think we look at Jesus as a vending machine. It's like, okay, I put this much effort in, now this is what I want to get back from you. And it really doesn't work that way. That's not showing a sign of trust. That doesn't mean that we trust in His provision and His timing. We have to approach Scripture with humility, seeking to understand God's truth rather than trying to make it fit our own agenda. Finally, in the third temptation, Satan offers Jesus all the kingdoms of the world if he would only worship Him. This is the most audacious temptation of all. He offers him a shortcut to power and dominion without the cross. But Jesus' response is clear. He says, you shall worship the Lord your God and him only shall you serve. Now this moment, this kind of reminds us that worship is not just about what we do on Sundays. Worship is about what we give our hearts to, what we prioritize, what we serve. If you were to just take a look at your schedule on a weekly basis through the lens of Christ, you'd start to see that maybe sometimes we prioritize things that are more important to us than they are to Him. Worship, is, it's important that we prioritize what God has planned for us, that we focus on that and trust in Him. He shows us that nothing, no amount of power, wealth, or success is worth giving our worship to over God. In our own lives, we may be tempted by the kingdoms of the world, big career opportunities, material comforts, personal achievements. This is what the world tells us that we use in order to measure our so-called success. But these things are really just kind of subtly drawing us, our attention away from God. Jesus calls us in his word to remain vigilant, to continually realign our hearts to him, and to ensure that nothing takes his place as the object of our worship. Now, I speak about this kind of stuff very passionately because I have experienced, like many of you have, some deep valleys in my life. Times when, if it wasn't for God, you may not realize it right at that moment, but if you surrender those times to God and then you look back later, you realize if it wasn't for Him, you might not have made it through. So it was really important to Nate that I share with you a little bit of my testimony. Back in 2000. Um, I'll give you a little backstory. I, I launched a, a commercial airline back in 2012 out of the Newport News area in Virginia Beach called People Express. It was the second iteration of People Express. I had worked at the first one back in the 80s before it became Continental. I won't get into all the details of that, but we started flying in 2014. We were doing incredibly well, uh, much better than we had ever expected. Uh, we were just a few weeks away from a uh, public offering to raise $50 million. We had already ordered new planes, and we were doing what we thought was going well. And then a 19-year-old kid, not paying attention, driving a truck on a ramp, ran into the side of one of the airplanes, and a lot of damage, a lot of long story, but the airline ended up shutting down. As a result of that, I left and immediately went to work into full-time ministry. I, the airline had been built on a, on a basis of God's um, biblical standards. It was crazy. My, the HR the vice president of the HR would always freak out because whenever we'd have a brand new class, we hired over 200 people, I would walk in and I would tell them right off the bat, I want you to know that I love Jesus more than anything and that we have established this business based on his values and his principles. Half the class would cheer and the other half would be like oh no <laughs> 
So there were some followers of Christ that there and some people who were, uh, the airline industry attracts everybody. So there were some people, but I said, you're all welcome to work here. But what we do expect is a standard of character and integrity when we operate. At one point, uh, one of the local news channels tried to, tried to make light of the fact and fun of the fact that if you checked into a flight at People Express and you told them that you were flying to Atlanta because your mom had died or there was some crisis in your family, the odds were very high that that employee was going to stop what they were doing and ask you if they could pray for you. So when it, this accident happened, I was like, God, I don't get it. You know, you, you, you got me to do this thing, and we did this based, and we honored you through it. And he just said, maybe I just want you to come work for me now. And the crazy thing is, a few days later, I had never considered full-time ministry. And a few days later, I got invited to a lunch, and a guy offered me a, a full-time job working in the Congressional Prayer Caucus, trying to get elected leaders to seek God. How crazy is that? <laughs> In 2017, the Commonwealth of Virginia conducted an investigation into the financial handlings of People Express because we had used some state funds. And after a three-month investigation, they came and said to us, wow, you guys did everything right. We accounted for every penny. You did everything with integrity. You're not a target of this investigation anymore. Thank you. They were, they were really appreciative. But two years, a little over two years later, I get a target letter in the mail from the Department of Justice Everybody knows how honest and straightforward they are. From the Department of Justice saying that they were charging me with a scheme to commit fraud because we had, I had notified unsecured creditors that they, we didn't have any money for them and there was money sitting in the bank. And a bank account that I wasn't the signer on, it was a bankruptcy. We weren't allowed to pay these people any money. So the ludicrousness of this was you know, not outside of my thought process. Every attorney that I met with said, this is ridiculous. It's the biggest stretch of this use of this statute that we've ever seen. In 2015, the United States Supreme Court determined that this particular statute that was the same one used against then Governor McDonnell was unconstitutional because it gave a prosecutor the ability to charge basically anybody in it that he wanted to, whether a crime was committed or not, because they said no crime of fraud ever was ever committed. But then this process begins where attorneys are telling me, oh, we can beat this on, on, um, uh, in pretrial motions because there's no basis for it, followed by then them not wanting the case anymore. It was a lot of intimidation from the federal justice system against attorneys who wanted to do that. They were driving me to use a federal public defender, which I ended up doing. I made it very clear to them that I was not going to admit to anything that I'd didn't do. I wasn't going to plea this case and admit to something that never happened. So, you know, all through this, I'm like, God, what are you doing? Uh, you know, I'm like, I don't quite understand. But I had long before learned that I don't have to understand everything he does. I just have to trust him. So I did. I trusted him. Long story short, they sat me down one day when I, when I pointed out to them that there were, the original indictment had was filled with lies. They, there was a document that they had had that was a bank account uh, uh, signature card that had my name typed on it for a bank account that was opened months after I left the company. So I took it to the bank, and when I did, the vice president of the bank looked at it, and he said, where'd you get this? We don't have one of these in our files. You were never on this account. We don't know. What's, and now my bank's attorney won't let me talk to you anymore. So, of course, I thought, we've got this. This is cool. And this is when they sat me down and said to me, listen, you were targeted. There is no way to win this. You have one choice. You plead guilty to one charge, and we'll let you go home to your family. If you don't, we'll see to it you spend 10 years in prison for something you didn't do. What do you do when the federal government tells you that? Part of me was like, God, I'm just going to trust you. I'll go to trial, and I'll expose these people. Every attorney in town said, take the plea. This particular prosecutor will lie and manipulate. He'll get people to get on a stand and tell lies about you. You can't win. And when you look into him, he's got a 98.98% win rate where most are about 67. So I did. Took the plea on the basis that I wouldn't have to go to prison. Guess what? They don't tell the truth all the time. But now I'm like, God, I know you've got this. I know you've got this. Something's going to happen here. This, I'm going to get you know, vindicated of this. There's no way this is going to happen. 
I get to sentencing and the prosecutor gets up to tell the judge. He tells the judge all these crazy stories about me moving money out of an account that I wasn't even a signer on. And I said to my attorney, how do you sit there and let him lie? I said, when I get up, I'm going to tell the judge that he lied. And she said, if you do, she'll send you to prison for five years just for calling a prosecutor a liar. The court will protect itself at all costs. Now, most of you might sit back five years ago and hear this story and go, nah, something's up, I don't believe it. But most of us that have paid attention to what the Department of Justice has been doing across the nation lately understand that. And I'm not going to go off into the political thing. I want to get to what God did. On sentencing day, I was sentenced to two years in federal prison. So they lied about telling me that I could go home if I pled guilty. I was sentenced to two years. They ended up through some motions that I filed. They reduced it down to 16 months. And six and a half months later, in the midst of the pandemic, after the attorney general had said no one on a nonviolent crime was to be sent to federal prison, I went. And when I got to the door, because I self-surrendered, the guy looked at me and he said, I don't know who you made angry, but I sent 78 guys home yet this week. So what are you doing here? The problem is, is that I had written a letter after sentencing to the judge and I had told her that the prosecutor lied. I had told her about the fake uh, uh, signature card. And the prosecutor found out about that. And he and my public defender made sure that I went to prison, even though everybody else was getting home confinement. This guy told me you won't be here two days. So don't get comfortable. <laughs> That's not going to be a problem. <laughs> Federal prison is nowhere to get comfortable. Needless to say, a lot went on. Uh, I, was, I was told three weeks later by a counselor that I was not going anywhere because the prosecutor and the warden were friends, and he had told the warden not to let me go. And then they got upset because I wrote a complaint to their attorney, and they transferred me to New Jersey, away from my family, further away. This is what they do. When I got off the bus up there, they said to me, if you write a letter like that here... He said, I'll ship you all over this country. You won't talk to your family for a year. I said, message received. But when I got into prison, the Lord said to me, okay, now you're where I want you to be. Start a Bible study. I'm like, hold up. These are some mean dudes in here. I'm 60 years old and I'm, I've never been to prison before. I think I got to take it a little bit easy. He's like, no, start a Bible study. So I put signs up around the building saying, I'm going to have a Bible study tonight at seven o'clock. And guys went by and tore the signs down. But I walked into this room that night and sat down with my Bible and I was alone for three nights in a row because I ended up telling everybody I'm going to do this every night. This is a dorm kind of a facility in the building. The third night, three or four guys came in, sat down. We had a great time. They were seeking the Lord so much. They were very repentant of their crimes. I didn't even ask them what they did. There was one guy in prison, and this is the story I want you to understand. There was one guy there that everyone told me from the start to stay away from. They said, if he sees your Bible, he'll rip the pages out of it. If you try to talk to him about Jesus, it will not go well for you. He, was, he carried himself in that place like he was in charge, and he had been the leader of a gang in the Bronx, New York, for a long time. So he was a, he was a tough dude. He was just a guy that you looked at and you thought, I'm, I'm going to cross the street and go the other way because I don't want to be around this guy. Well, about the fourth day that I had started these Bible studies, two of his guys came to my room and they summoned me to meet with him. The guys in my room were scared to death. They were like, you've offended him somehow. They took me to a room and I was in the room by myself with him and he said, why are you doing this Bible study every night? And I started talking to him about the, what, what God told me to do. And he go, I said, do you know Jesus? And he goes, no, I don't, nor do I want to. And I said, well, he knows he loves you. He created you. He had a plan and a purpose for you and it wasn't for you to be here. And I won't get into everything that we sat, but we sat there for two and a half hours because he wanted to hear about it. And at the end of that two and a half hours, he was on his face on the ground crying so hard, begging God to forgive him for the crimes that he had committed and the sins that he had committed, begging God to come into his life and to be the Lord of his life. When I finally got him to stand up, I just gave him a hug, which I guess you're not supposed to do in prison, but I gave him a hug. And this is the most profound thing I'd ever heard. He looked at me and he said, you're the only man that has ever hugged me in my life. Wow, that just opened my eyes. And it almost instantly, I felt like God said to me, now you know why I have you here. 
it changed my entire perspective about being there. I wasn't sending motions and filing papers to try to get out anymore. I just said, okay, just use me. That night, he showed up at the Bible study. Now, the reason that he wouldn't come into the Bible study is because he said there were sex offenders in the Bible study. And that's when I told him, I said, I didn't ask him what they did. He said, well, in prison, the guys that have been charged as sex offenders are completely excluded from everyone, and no one else wants to mix with them ever. They're not allowed to sit at the same table to eat. They can't come in the TV rooms. They're not treated very well. He walked into that room that night, and he shook hands with each one of those sex offenders. You should have seen the look on their face when he walked in. They thought they were getting ready to get beat up. He shook hands with every one of them. He apologized to them for the way he had treated them and the way they had been treated. He called them his friends, and he said, "This will not. no one will, do, will hurt you again. They were now his brothers in Christ. And that word spread through that building so fast that the next night there were 22 guys in the Bible study. And it ended up going on five nights a week, 20, 25 guys. And then because the chapel was closed, I would do a church service on Sunday mornings in the, tele, in the sports TV room, which is just unheard of. They just, 70, 80 guys or 300 in the building would show up every week. And there'd be others that would be kind of standing on the... It was amazing what God did. So this is what the guards did. They came around and said, you can't do this anymore. In the Bureau of Prisons, Christians are not allowed to gather more than four people together. Now, the Muslims gather 20, 22 guys every single day, five times a day, and they chant their prayers, and we are not allowed to interfere with them under threat of punishment. But the Christians can only gather in the chapel. But the chapel was closed. And the guards would come and they would say to me, you keep doing this, you're going to lose your good time, and you're going to go to the hole. And I would say, listen, God told me to do this. i got to do it. I'm not stopping this momentum. And every day we would still go in there and every other day the guards would come in and they would sometimes come in and they would bring their wands and pat guys down just to disrupt our time together. And finally, one morning I got up and I heard my name announced over the speaker to come down to the office. Not usually a good thing. But I walked in there and the captain of the prison was there and he looked at me and he said, so you're the guy. And I said, I don't know. <laughs> Depends on what you're going to say next. He said, let me tell you something. Keep doing what you're doing. Just keep doing what you're doing. He said, these guards won't bother you anymore. He said, I don't know what's happening here. He said, but we haven't had any problems in this building for the long, most extended period of time ever. This build, no stabbings, no beatings. We haven't had to come over here and raid the building and clear people out. And there's been no lockdown. And he goes, so you must be doing something right. And I said, no, no, Jesus is showing up. There were guys walking around the building with Bible. My wife and I bought so many Bibles for guys in that place. And there were guys who would come to me and they'd be reading the Bible and they'd come during the day and they'd want some explanation. It was so beautiful that I tell people now I spent eight months in federal prison and I wouldn't pass it up for anything. What God did in me and through me and in our relationship and the intimacy that we had together and what he allowed me to do with, for other people in that place was absolutely amazing. There are so many of those guys that have, been, that have gotten out that I still stay in touch with them and their families. So many wives and moms and sisters that would call me after I got out and just thank me for introducing their, their, their loved one to Christ. I was so humbled by what God allowed me to do there. I didn't like where I had to go. But when we raise our hands and we say, God, send me, I'll go. And I did that. When this happened, I was indicted literally a few days after I got back from 12 days in China, where I was preaching in an underground church and saw people just so in love with God and people that are persecuted so much, they lose their jobs, they lose their families, they lose their homes, and they don't care. They have fallen in love with the holiness and the goodness and the beauty of Christ. They know that the only thing that matters in this world is Jesus. See, I have met with the Lord and been in His presence in ways that I could never explain before this happened to me. I know He walked with me every day. I, I know, I believed in Psalm 91, 11 to 12, where it says, He will command His angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. They will lift, up you, lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. Let me tell you something. Being a 60-year-old white guy in prison for the very first time is not a comfortable place to be. I was never afraid. 
And believe me, the Muslims didn't like the fact that I was doing Bible studies every night. And they would come and they would talk to me and they would threaten me. And you know what would end up happening? Some of the guys would stand outside the door when we would be doing our Bible studies. And some of them came to me one time and they said, the guy who leads this is not happy with you, but don't worry, we're never going to let him touch you. There were some of the guys in that, or that group that would come to me privately and say, can you just talk to me about Jesus? We all know that when Jesus shows up, everybody says, mm, this is what I want. This is what I want. Guys walked around that building every day in fear, and I didn't. The guys in my room were like, there's something too joyous about you being in prison. I'm like, no, because, <laughs> listen, I, the, when, I, when I was first in Petersburg, I read the Bible from Genesis all the way to the end in nine days. When you're locked in a room, undistracted, the only thing you had in your hand is a Bible. No newspapers, no radio, no television, no nothing. I just read the Bible 10 hours a day. And it came to life in a way that it never had before for me. He spoke to me that my time in prison was there to serve his purpose. The crazy thing is my kids, of course, were devastated until they hear from my voice on the phone. And all I would do is be so excited about the, another man came to the Bible study today. Another guy has accepted Jesus. These two guys have, that have been warring enemies for a long time are now friends. They're now sitting side by side. The room would be full. It was the only place in prison, in that prison, where whites, blacks, and Hispanics all came together. We all ate separated. We all watched television separated. It was crazy. And I was the only dude that was allowed in the black TV room, which was the best one. I just got to tell you, they watched the best TV. <laughs> Guards would walk by and see me in there and be like, what are you doing in here? And the leader of that room would be like, he's with us. He's good. I could sit at their tables at lunch too. They didn't care. No, I just, I had access to everybody because I wasn't a threat to anyone. I wasn't there to do anything other than just share the goodness of God. He is calling us beloved, to take ground for the kingdom. This is where we're missing up. This is what's happening in our society. The reason that people are so accepting of men walking into your daughter's locker room is because Christians have been like, I'm not going to fight. I don't want to fight. I don't want the persecution. But we can because we have the sword of the Spirit. It is designed for an offensive attack. It is, it's, the Christian life is not about holding on to what we have in a world of spiritual warfare. It's about advancing the kingdom of God, putting on the full armor. We're not just bracing ourselves against an attack. We're called to take action, to move forward and to claim new ground for Christ in a world that so desperately needs it. The sword is the word of God. The Bible tells us it's sharper. It's than any two-edged sword. It doesn't just hold back the enemy. It cuts through lies and deception and darkness. It pierces deep and reveals truth. We want to bring conviction. I don't want people to be offended by what I say to them. I want them to feel conviction. And I want to remind them that the conviction they feel is because they have a God who loves them so much, even if they're not following him right now. So we're called to wield this sword, the word of God, with confidence, not passively, but boldly. We don't just hold our position. We press forward. We advance the gospel and the truth of Christ to a world that's in need. But here's what we don't do. We don't make our mission field our enemy. We can't do that. This is where we're running into some problems because we're fighting. We're starting to look more like the world. Let them yell and holler. Let them be divisive. Let them be condemning. That's not who we are. And that's where we stand apart. When we can stand apart and be the salt of the earth, be the light of Jesus. In Ephesians 6, Paul describes God's word as the sword of the Spirit. He emphasizes it as as the most important role in our spiritual defense and our spiritual offense. Jesus used Scripture to overcome temptation. We are called to equip ourselves with this powerful tool. And you know how we do that? We read the Word of God. We memorize Scripture. We understand what our responsibility is in a dark world. We study. We meditate on the, world, on the Word. We have to immerse ourselves in God's Word. And I promise you, if you do it to check a box every day, it's not going to have the same effect on you that it is if you do it when you're undistracted and you're doing it for your life. I felt like the only hope I had 
of either surviving that, both physically, emotionally, was to immerse myself in the Word of God. We take time, we reflect deeply on Scripture, and we ask God to reveal His heart to us instead of telling Him about our own hearts. We apply His truth to our circumstances every day. So there are times all throughout a day that we'll say we'll face temptations, we'll face trials. We have an opportunity to go to the Word of God. We may not always have an opportunity to open our Bibles right in that spot. So this is why it's so important that we recognize, that we memorize Scripture, that we understand Scripture, that we arm ourselves with the Word of God in order to combat whatever comes our way. It's like having a, a sharpened sword ready for battle. And prayer and Scripture go hand in hand. When we pray using God's Word, we align our hearts with His promises and declare His truth over our own lives. Scripture tells us that God's Word never returns void. So when we pray His Word, we stand on unshakable ground. Praying Scripture strengthens our faith and reminds us that victory comes, not from our own efforts, but from God's promises. In every challenge or temptation, the Word gives us the upper hand. It helps us recognize the lies of the enemy. We want to have discernment so that we can, because it's really, Jay and I were just talking, it's really hard to discern truth these days. But God's Word shows us how to stand firm in the promises that He's made. And more than that, to fight back and reclaim what the enemy has stolen. I'm going to wrap this up by telling you that we have a call on our lives to live boldly. We're going to face deserts. There's no time, no, no doubt about that. Jesus made it clear to us that we would. But it's in those moments that we look to Jesus as our perfect example. He didn't rely on his own strength, but he relied on the Word of God. Every time Satan came at him, he responded with Scripture. That's all we have to do. And just as Jesus was equipped with God's truth, we can arm ourselves with the sword of the Spirit as well. Victory doesn't come from our own strength but from standing on the promises of God and speaking them into our situations. The enemy trembles at the truth of Scripture because he knows it's unshakable and he knows it's eternal. We win our battles by knowing, believing, and speaking the Word of God with confidence in every situation, knowing that it has the power to defeat every lie. I, know, I, I pray that this message today is a vital reminder to you that Jesus, just as He demonstrated to us when He was tempted, the Word is our ultimate weapon. We don't have to try to figure this out. God figured it out for us. He gave us the best self-help book we could ever ask for. Because let's face it, we're in a spiritual battle in this country today. We face constant spiritual challenges. Opportunities to where we either can stand, sometimes alone, sometimes in a crowd of people that totally disagree with us. God is looking for us to say, I have raised my hand and said I will not only be a disciple, but I will make disciples. And I do that by always walking this life out in the image of Christ. We push back against the dark forces that are at work in our country, doing everything they can to hinder God's work. Let's pray together. You all stand. Heavenly Father, we come before you today grateful for your power, for the power of your word that strengthens and sustains us. Empower us, Lord, through your truth so that no matter what challenges or trials we face, we can stand firm in faith. When life starts to feel uncertain or difficult for us, just remind us, Lord, to be steadfast in our worship, to trust in your guidance. Lead us through every challenge, every season of dryness that we experience, and into the abundant life that only you can provide and that you have promised us. We know, Lord, that with you we're never alone, and in your strength we can overcome anything the enemy throws at us. We pray this in the mighty and matchless name of your Son, Jesus. Amen. Thank you. Because all my life you have been faithful. 
Oh, all my life, all my life, you have been so, so good. With every breath, with every breath that I am made.